that's why when I started the rim type table for resin work, it is so easy to do because there's already a ready-made rim and all you have to do is cover it with a canvas. Welcome to the Fluid Arts Podcast with your host, Keevan White, where we dive into the wonderful world of fluid arts, including acrylic pouring, alcohol ink, resin art, and more. In this podcast, we let talented artists share with us their techniques, inspirations, and tips for creating amazing fluid art. Whether you want to earn a living making art or improve your work, this is the podcast for you. So sit back and relax as we take you on a journey to learn more about this exciting and engaging art form. Welcome to another episode of the Fluid Arts Podcast. This is your host, Keevan Jr., and today we have a compelling artist by the name of Rocky Ja. Rocky, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Kevin. Hey, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Yes. And can you tell the audience, for those who may not be familiar with you, you're in India, but which, you know, where, where specifically in India? I'm in a, a, a town called Gurgaon, which is uh, literally adjacent to New Delhi, which is the capital of India. So um, I've been here for uh, nine years now. And before that, I was uh, in New York City for 16 plus years. Yeah. Nice. And then from your artist background, how long have you, would you say you've been an artist? I started uh, about a year back uh, on the side while I was working full time as an architect. Um, I started with uh, doing art on furniture. Uh, I just found the, um, uh, you know, I was just very passionate about it. And when I would go to buy furniture for my own use, I wouldn't find what I was exactly looking for, which is more ab abstract looking art on furniture, you know, and I always thought, um, why, uh, why does art have to be limited to canvas? And that's when I started uh, venturing out trying to do a few pieces for my own self about a year back. So to answer your question, it was a long answer, but about eight, nine months back when I really discovered uh, fluid arts. Sure. Okay. And I can see, you know, not only did it meet its utilitarian purpose for it, you know, being useful yeah. around the house and stuff, but you also had a lot of comments. I mean, from the different videos that you posted in the group, it's probably yeah. somewhere like maybe 1500 comments all combined. Um, yeah. <laughs> whether they're helping you with names or colors and we're going to cover all that so if the listeners if you want to take a look at some examples and the one that we're talking about today as well as a video on her youtube channel of how she created this piece mm -hmm. we're going to put that in the show notes so just go down below and click that so um Rocky, yeah for the tables i know you said you have the architect background did mm -hmm. you have you built or you know made any of these tables no, but you know, I found a fascinating way. Um, I myself am not heavily into carpentry or anything, but um, in India, it's a bit more accessible, I would say, uh, to get a carpenter to do stuff for you. Um, it's uh, more affordable and you would get uh, uh, easily get people, good carpenters to do it. But what I did was I found... Um, trays you know a like little bit larger trays maybe one foot round or uh, 15 inch 18 inch round trays with the rims around the trays and I would get a carpenter to make legs for those trays and that's how I completed a table okay and so you go to your carpenter you to the local the trees, carpenter local yeah. carpenters yeah. okay for those yeah. that may not have a or know a local carpenter in their mm -hmm. city country mm -hmm. Uh, would you what would you recommend for them getting just something to just any surface if you're not handy with doing carpentry work yourself i'm sure you could find somebody who could do simple legs for it or you could find like a kit out of amazon and you could just get screw on uh, legs for it you know but there are two types of tables that i i like to do and the challenges with both the types um, there are challenges with both the types. One is the uh, surround that would hold your resin and pouring resin and curing resin becomes very easy on that. Then I started venturing out uh, over to tables where you didn't have the rim all around. And in that, the pouring became easy in terms of the acrylic pouring, 
but the resin was very hard. Then you had to tape off the air bottom of the table, make sure that the resin consistently, you know, um, fell off the sides. So that the sides are as pretty because they're visible as your tabletop are. So you have to find your comfort level, I think, first as to which one that you can handle, whether it's the resin part or whether it's the acrylic pouring part. And then go for that type of design, I would say, in, in your first try. And then as you get used to it, um, you will have better control. Okay, so with the, the edge, when you're using the Dutch pour, for example, how do you not get paint on the edge, on the inside? So I use tape on the bottom mm. and on the insides. With the rim type you're asking, I tape it. Yes. I tape the inside. And I'll give one tip for that is a lot of people have asked me this on, on the acrylic pouring site as well when I post is how does the acrylic pour doesn't come off, doesn't it come off with the tape when it's dry, you know, when it's relatively dry. So what I do is I tape off the inside, I do my pouring, and then once the paint settles a bit, maybe like an hour, two hour, even three hours, I take the tape off very gently. And it, it's still very fluid at that time and it comes out very clean. But if you wait too long, then the acrylic pour itself, the paint itself gets stuck to the tape. And then there is a danger of when you remove the tape, the, the part of your uh, painting uh, pour of the, um, the acrylic paint itself might come off. So you have to be yeah. a little bit careful of that, yeah. Yeah, I have a painting right now that I'm looking at. I, that happened to me. I waited too yeah. long and it kind of ruined it a That's little right. bit. But Just, I'm sure a lot yeah. of uh, artists can relate to that. Right. But any tips for choosing your colors? This is where it becomes less art <laughs> and more science. <laughs> I think uh, choosing your colors is very important and how you layer them is very important. Primary colors, when mixed together, make beautiful secondary colors. But when you're choosing a color which is already secondary color, when mixed together with other colors, they turn brown. You know, when you overwork the hairdryer or even mm -hmm. when you tilt it, it just becomes more brownish and it becomes muddier. So you have to be careful about which color uh, you layer over which. So I would say... Um, if you feel that you have two secondary colors picked out, uh, layer something else in between, maybe a white or maybe a gold, a metallic in between. That's what I try to do. And most of the time it works out pretty good. Okay, that's awesome. One thing I, I didn't want to skip past is the consistency. Yeah. When yeah. You mentioned specifically with the tray with the rim. Yeah. You don't want to pour too much. Right. Uh, what is that consistency of the paint? It's, see, I like to keep it simple. I don't use too many products to mix my paint. I mostly use paint and water. And maximum I would use is a pouring medium, uh, which is like a Liquitex pouring medium or something local that I get called a uh, brand called Brustro. Uh, that is a paint conditioner. Uh, because, you know, in India where I am, um, I don't get uh, things very readily available. Like uh, everyone in the art world I'm seeing in the pouring world use Floetrol. Um, I don't get that very readily available. And if I do get it, it's extremely expensive. So it doesn't make sense for me to use products when I'm trying to keep my business affordable. And, um, and then, you know, you want to keep it simple as well as you want to keep it affordable so that you can do more of it. And... Um, so I use only paint and water most of the times. Very rarely I use um, uh, pouring medium. Uh, and most of the times, uh, in fact, I've just recently procured a, a bottle of Floetrol and I've started using it just in the base. And this is an experiment that I'm doing that I feel like I'm getting a bit more details and um, uh, lacings and cells uh, with using it just in the base and not on the top colors. So I would say wherever you are, keep it as simple as you can. And the consistency, um, I have a couple of videos on that, but you can go pretty high in, in terms of water and paint ratio. If you use a decent brand of paint, then you can go with almost, I've noticed, 75% water in that uh, to mix uh, you know, for the ratio. And um, 
but the pigment doesn't break up. You just use a little bit water at a time and don't go with all the water at a time. So, and uh, the pigments, you know, the consistency works out pretty good. And the amount of paint when you're doing on the table that you pour, you just have to make sure what I do is that the base coat, I don't make it too thick. I keep that as thin as possible, but so that it's totally covered and none of my bottom surface is showing, but I stretch it out quite thin. And then the top colors, I add a bit more. Okay. So when you say stretch it out, you're talking about like, you, you put a little bit on there and, and, and move, and move it, it around. I like, tilt it okay. around. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. All right. So yeah, there's a lot of tips, tricks, do's and don'ts. There. Yeah, I, like I really, that. I really am big on, uh, you know, keep it affordable, keep it simple. Don't go by what everybody is doing because everybody's situations are different. Everybody is in different regions and what is affordable to one may not be affordable to the other. Uh, in the US, Floetrol is used because it's a good paint conditioner and it is affordable. Um, but if you, if you can't, if, you know, in your country afford it, then try paint in uh, water, you know, it works. It works pretty well. Sure, yeah, I like that. Okay, mm -hmm. and then for these specific tables, do you uh, get many commissions yeah. where, you know, people want you to, how do you, how do you sell tables, uh, your so, furniture? I know you use So I use my website. I have my Mohinima website and I also post on social media. So whether I do it on Instagram or Facebook, and of course, all your sites, I'm quite active in it. And locally, you know, I mean, it's word of mouth. Uh, uh, one person bought it, they loved it, they recommended it to their friends. Uh, now it's become a thing about all friends wanting the same, you know, signature table, you know, things like that. So initially I made quite a few to just put it on the website. And then I saw that it was getting sold quite quickly. But then there was always a challenge because if I made one in the blues and reds, somebody wanted greens and yellows. And if I made, you know, if, if I made it in a white base, somebody wanted a black base. Mm -hmm. So then I, and, and table is not something that you can pour on again and again, and it's hard to store and, you know, all that stuff. So then I started making a more on commission now, but the rest, I think you as an artist, because you have experience on uh, how to do this and which colors work together, uh, that much interference uh, you should not have and you should keep that control. Sure. So what about the dimensions? If somebody says, you know, in combination with the colors and how they want it style wise, mm -hmm. is it like if they have a certain dimension, can they also come to you and say, hey, I want it this height? Usually accent tables are quite standard, I would say, you know, unless it's a bigger piece, which I have not yet ventured too much into because you know, it's just easier to do uh, smaller pieces right now. Um, I, and most of the accent tables are usually 18 inch round. You know, if you keep a generic sort of size, say from 16 inch to 18 inch or 19 inch round or square, the height is usually 20 inches, 21 inches uh, as an accent piece. Uh, you know, you're pretty much set. I mean, people are not very fussy about that because it works with most of their furniture. I keep a couple of shapes in hand and a couple of styles in hand. So I will have one with uh, a different type of legs, maybe some metal legs. I will have uh, a few with tripod legs. So I keep a couple of choices and I have seen most of the time it works within that itself. You know, people like one or the other. Nice, I like that. Okay, now yeah. let's talk about the resin for a second. Um, can you walk mm -hmm. us through the resin process? Like kind of, you know, how long it takes for the acrylic pouring to dry and then what do you do to apply the resin so acrylic pouring um in general i think it should be uh left to dry for about three to four weeks but having said that i have done it uh as close to three weeks uh two weeks because in Indi indian summers are pretty hot and uh i'm able to do it but if you're in a cooler climate and colder zone like in the winter time here even I would leave it for at least three weeks to four weeks uh, before I do the resin uh, on it. How do you prevent dust from accumulating yeah. while the resin is drying? Yeah, this is a big challenge, uh, especially for bigger items. So if it's a table, uh, it's extremely challenging to do this. So I have created some boxes out of cardboard. Um, also, one of the 
quick tips, <laughs> uh, quick, easy ways to do it is I have uh, now, uh, I have a studio in one room and I'm also, uh, I have built a nice size table uh, to work uh, on. So that table is a nice height. So I usually store, I do my resin work at night and I keep the table underneath the, um, the, my work table so that it becomes an automatic, uh, uh, you know, uh, enclosure for it. Yeah. And you can always tape off the sides with plastic. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah so actually that it. works pretty well. Yeah. Actually that works pretty well. And it just occurred to me that this whole big table, five foot by three foot and underneath was, uh, was empty. <laughs> so I started using that, uh, for my curing of my resin. Yeah. And it's extremely hard. I tell you, you know, the few tips <laughs> I do is I spray the surface around so that if there's any dust and India is very dusty, especially we're close to Rajasthan. So we get a lot of, especially in the summertime, dust uh, uh, waves and winds and come, you know, comes uh, this way. Um, so I spray the environment around the air around with, uh, with my water bottle and that settles the dust. And then I do the resin and immediately, you know, when you have the, the, that's why when I started the rim type table for resin work, it is so easy to do because there's already a ready-made rim and all you have to do is cover it with a canvas. Ah, uh, that's smart. That's smart. Yeah. So that actually for resin, because resin is so tricky in terms of dust and keeping it clean and, you know, all that stuff that it actually works out pretty good. So the challenges is more on the acrylic pouring side but then you get a hang of it as you do more and more pieces. Okay. So just like anything, repetition and you'll, you'll eventually get it. Yeah. You practice makes perfect. That's exactly it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. We'll learn how to do this or see how mm -hmm. Raki does it. Go ahead and click in the show notes, but if they want to, you know, reach out to you, where should they find you? The, you can find me uh, on my own Facebook uh, uh, site. I'm also active on Instagram, on YouTube, and you can always send me a message through my uh, company website, uh, which is mohinima.com. I think I remember you telling me there was a story behind your company name, Mo Mohanima. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to share that? So, yeah, so it's a little bit of an emotional story, but it's, uh, it's uh, my, my parents have, is the reason why I moved back to India uh, after being in New York for so long. And um, so I lost both my parents in the last um, few years. So I lost my mom three years back and my dad a year back. And after I lost my dad is when I full fledgedly went into this venture. I actually started doing it as a hobby, um, but being a, in the professional line for so long, the hobby turned into a small business for me. And my dad's name uh, was Mohan. And my mom's name was Nima. And so that's where Mohinima came from. And uh, Mohinima actually uh, is a nice Hindi word as well. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And um, that's, that's very precious. I like that. Yeah, I, I hope I make them proud. Yeah, and, I, and we appreciate you sharing that and, you know, taking that moment with us. Thank you. Um, if you want to see more of the beautiful work that Raki is doing, click the, the video in the show notes, as well as the links that we have to her social medias. So mm -hmm. thank you for stopping by, Raki. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's been a pleasure. And I just hope that people try out more of this and would love to see people stable uh, once they try it out, you know? Yes, and I'm sure they will. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please like and share with your community. And please let us know if you have any suggestions for artists you'd like to hear on our show. This episode is sponsored by AcrylicPouring.com. AcrylicPouring.com is the leading fluid arts website which provides fluid artists around the world the inspiration and tips they need. If you are new to fluid arts and want to get started now, then go to acrylicpouring.com to learn the five fundamentals of making beautiful acrylic pours for free. Also, join their Facebook community, where every day artists just like you are sharing their newest creations that just might end up on another one of these episodes.